and all of a sudden you're in Mongolia and you're looking into the eyes of the descendants of Genghis Khan and you realize that you're weaving your way through this tapestry of fascinating cultures that you're really merging with the landscape of humanity. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we talk to athletes, adventurers, and business owners from around the world of adventure sports. Whether you're climbing Mount Everest, starting a bike shop, or getting up off your couch to take your kids hiking for the first time, we want you to have the motivation and inspiration you need to chase that next adventure. The Adventure Sports Podcast is brought to you by Camp Crate, the leaders in fully planned self-guided backpacking adventures, as well as backpacking gear rental. You can check them out at campcrate.net. Hey folks, just want to jump straight into it. We haven't had one about motorcycles in a while, and this one is about taking a motorcycle around the world um, with Glenn Hegstad. This was done by Travis, like, almost four years ago now. This was an early episode, maybe three and a half. But anyway, it is it is an epic story of chasing adventure and then things don't always go to plan. And this guy's story is unbelievable. He uh, was a martial art teacher, decided to go on this long motorcycle journey and, and he had this crazy story happen. So much so that National Geographic even did mini documentary about it and it, it was just nuts but you know for a lot of us you know for me included my my joints my body will one day probably not be able to do all these things and I want to do things you know motorcycle will probably be in my future is what I'm trying to say I'd like to travel by motorcycle one day give that a shot touring and you know stories like this kind of <laughs> scare me to death from doing it and this I've heard others as well but this is adventure man adventure does not always go to plan and if everything went right, you wouldn't have a story to tell. But, you know, God forbid it ever gets to the point that you go through what Glenn here went through. I hope you enjoy the story. And our sponsors are Athletic Brewing. They are also uh, funding the Adventure Grant. If you are having an adventure this year or next year, not next year, but someone else you know is, apply. It's in the show notes. But Athletic Brewing are the makers of the best non-alcoholic beer in the world. They actually won a competition recently, kind of to prove that. And also, Aftershocks headphones. They are headphones that don't go in your ears, but you can still hear this podcast loud and clear and hear the noise around you. Great for training, great for safety. They even have waterproof versions for the rain, for swimming, and they are wireless, so it's super convenient for doing what we do in the outdoors and outside in general. But let's get right into this. I hope you enjoy. And this is a Throwback Thursday episode, but it's a it's an awesome one. In 2001, Glenn Hegstad departed on a trip of a lifetime to the tip of South America, as numerous travelers have. But Glenn's trip took a bit of a detour when he was captured in Colombia by rebels and held for five weeks. During that time, he was tortured and starved until he found a way out of his terrible ordeal. Even after all of that, Glenn did something most of us can't even imagine. But instead of ruining the surprise, I'll let Glenn tell you about his journey. Glenn, welcome to the show. Hey, uh, thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you. So you have a truly amazing story, and I can't wait to get into it. But for starters, let's get into how you ended up on two wheels from their beginning. You had a bit of a tough upbringing. What started you on motorcycles from the get-go? Well, I um, I was probably like 12 years old, and um, my father and I built a uh, a little, we called them doodle bugs at the time, but it was like a little two-wheeled mini bike and with a lawnmower engine. And so... Um, as every motorcycle aficionado knows, once you get that two-wheel fever, it just never goes away. It just gets more intense. And <laughs> so, true. well, you know, the more we ride, the more we think about one day, you know what? I'm not going to work. I'm just going to keep going and see what happens. So that's basically how I got, got going on the South America gig. I'd, I'd ridden around um, Southeast Asia back in the 80s. Um, on a VMAX that I'd uh, shipped into Penang, Malaysia, and 
and then smuggled into Thailand because a bike that big was against the law at that time. So I'd done that, you know, and I and um, done a lot of riding around the U.S. and Canada, but never anything like heading for South America. And this was like a couple of weeks right after 9/11. So, you know, the, if you can remember back then, all the the, the the nation, if not the world, was in turmoil, and everybody was wondering what's next and what's going to happen. And um, I took off for South America, and of course, my family and friends were freaking out over that. They just yeah, I'll bet most world. people, most people at that time were kind of ready to hunker down and and not go anywhere, and you instead determined to uh, to go see the world and and set out and buck the trail. Yeah, here's the way here's the way I, I see it is. Terrorism, I mean, what they're after, terrorists, is to terrorize us, to scare us. They want us to hate one another. They want us to hate somebody because of the skill, uh, color of their skin or their religion or their politics or something. And they want us to be afraid. They want us to stay home and hide under the bed. And that's what they want to do. They want to scare us into hating and they want to scare us, period, into fear. So to combat terrorism, of course, you know, we've got the CIA and the FBI and these government agencies and military and whatnot, but we as individual citizens of the of the country and of the world, in fact, our our main weapon against terrorism is the refusal to hate and a refusal to be afraid. So uh, it seemed to me that it was very logical to go now more than ever. Um, and of course my my friends and family didn't see it that way. And I don't know how to explain it, but it, to me it was like it was a message. You know, what? first of all, the likelihood of another terrorist attack right after a first one is absolutely zero. It's it's really our way uh, as a free people to stand up and and say, uh, you know, screw you to um, to these terrorist organizations. We are not going to hate. We're not going to hate Christians or Jews or Muslims or anybody. And we're going to uh, we're going to go out and live our lives. You know, I remember after 9-11, it's just like American flags popped up everywhere. Well, good for you for doing that. So what was what was it about South America? Why that trip? I was retired. I was competing in judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu on a national and international level. And that just takes up your whole life. I mean, you don't you don't have a life. It's six hours a day, six days a week. And, you know, I mean, you got to do you got to train because the guy you're going to be in the ring with in, in, in a year from now is uh, that's what he's doing. So. You want him drinking beer and eating pizza and skipping practice. So, <laughs> I mean, that requires so much focus. And I, and I'd been in the martial arts for a couple of decades, you know, really, really intense. And, um, I'm, I'm pretty beat up for it and I, I needed to get away. And, and I just basically said, the only way I can stay off the mat is to jump on my motorcycle and go somewhere, you know? And so that's, I said, South America, you know, you need kind of a challenge. And I mean, nowadays it's, it's a, it's a freeway of motorcycles, uh, coming and going to South America. But back then, you know, there was maybe four people during the course of a year that were, that were taking that trip, you know? Yeah, that's true. We hear about that trip planned a lot lately. And I think the, uh, the idea of going down to Tierra de Fuego is growing just as rapidly as the adventure motorcycle trend is in itself. So it's, it's only been in recent years, but when you decided to do this, it was, it was kind of unheard of for the most part back then. Well, I had done a shakedown ride prior to that to Guatemala. And I mean, it, this was like in 1999. And the, 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 the scare stories, and it's funny because they say the same one in every country in the world. Even my Mexican-American friends said, oh, man, you'll never get across Mexico. It's terrible. It's crazy down there. The cops, the bandits, you know, all these terrible things that people hate you and, uh, and blah, blah, blah. And of course, but the women, they're very free and they'll be all over you. <laughs> I say, okay, cool. So I get to Mexico and all the guys say, hola, amigo, vamos a tomar una cerveza. Let's go have a beer. Let's go eat. And I said, okay, uh, donde están las chicas? Where's the girls? You know, and they said, well, the girls are in church. <laughs> <So> I, <laughs> That's kind of the opposite of what you're so told. So <laughs> then I'm getting ready to go to Guatemala, you know, and the Mexicans are saying goodbye. And they say, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going to Guatemala. And they said, oh, it's very dangerous. You can't go there. You know, Mexico's safe, but you can't go there because the police will rob you and there's banditos. But the women are very free and they'll be all over you. So I said, okay, cool. So I get to Guatemala and it's, hola, amigo. <laughs> Where's the girls? The girls are in church. 
Like, Let's go have a beer. <laughs> go to El Salvador, guess what? Well, our country's very safe in Guatemala, but El Salvador is dangerous. You have to be careful. The police will rob you and the banditos. But the women are very wild and they'll be all over you. So believe it or not, every single country <laughs> as I traveled around the world said the same thing. Our country's safe, but it's the other one. That's great. This story is starting to sound familiar. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I went down there to El Salvador, you know, and, and, and had a great time. Turned around, came back, and and um, just got ready for for the big one for South America, and then uh, okay. and headed off. Cool. All right. So tell me about the the big trip to South America. You started in California, right? I did. I did. I, I live in the Coachella Valley in Palm Desert, California. And I took off. I went down through Mexico. You know, spent a week uh, a week in Mexico, and then. And then another uh, week or two going through Central America. And then I, it took me about, a, I all told a month to get to Colombia. And, you know, I mean, it was right before Christmas and there was talk of a Christmas truce and all these things. And I was, you know, kind of scoping the internet to see if it was safe. And, you know, I get, I get to Medellin and um, I had the air freight from, from Panama city. You couldn't get across a Darien. And now they have a ferry that, that takes vehicles, but they didn't then. So you either had a, strap your bike on somebody's sailboat or, or air freight uh, into Bogota. And I got to Bogota and I started asking people and they said, nah, don't worry. They're just after rich people. They see you on a motorcycle. Nobody's going to bother you. They're going to think you're, you know, too poor to bother with and, and whatnot. So I actually was going to travel slightly Northwest to, uh, to Medellin before going South because I mean, it was supposed to be patrolled by the military and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I got grabbed and it was, it was kind of spooky. It was, it's a, it's a windy road. It's a couple hundred miles from, uh, it's like 200 miles from Medellin, uh, Medellin to Bogota. And uh, I, I was winding my way through the mountains and these little hairpin turns. I came around a corner and, and, uh, and uh, there was the, um, the rebels, uh, the guerrillas waiting in the roadway with machine guns, AK-47s. And, uh, you know, at a time like that, you got a lot going through your head. And I was thinking, I maybe I'll just make a run for it. And then once they got the walkie, you see the walkie talkies, you realize that they could, they could, um, you know, if I got by a, a gun, the gunfire there, the, the gorillas down the road would have better luck. So I stopped and just to see what was going to happen. And I, I didn't understand it. I'd taken a couple of semesters of Spanish. And so these guys were screaming just, Ropa, ropa, and going through my saddlebags and throwing clothes on the on the ground. And another guy was putting my clothes into a paper bag. And uh, I thought, oh, cool, I'm 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 just going to be robbed. And I'm actually doing mental calculations, like, well, I can replace that, I can buy that again. <laughs> and they're tearing stuff off my handlebars, and I'm thinking, well, you know what? It's it's still not that bad, you know. And then all of a sudden, it's get off the bike, you know, and and uh, I um. They point to the to the jungle and they said vamos and I just I just said I'm not going. I just flat out said I'm not going. There was there was it, I was pretty well convinced they were just going to kill me in the jungle and you know the stuff that's running through your mind nobody's going to find me and they had stopped a bus at that same time and uh, the people on the bus there I look at they're crying and they're ducking and they're hiding and some are pretending they don't see and. Uh, then all of a sudden the rebels waved the bus on, like get rid of any witnesses. Really, so I was pretty well convinced that it was time to make a decision to die in the street or die in the jungle. And uh, of course, there was a lot of fools on the internet speculating, like why would I, why would I provoke these guys? And I and I actually did. I figured, you know, I'll, I'll take it. I take it here instead of the jungle. And um, all I can say is, you had to have been there. That right. was neither an act of stupidity nor bravery. It was sheer logic. You think about your family and you disappear. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to die one way or the other. I'll take it here. So I, I actually uh, cursed him, you know, said stuff about his mother. And then he pulls a, a yanks a nine millimeter pistol out of his uh, shoulder holster and aims it right at my arm. And then says, vamos. And then I realized that, well, if he's going to shoot me in the arm, at least he's not going to kill me, but I'm going with him with or without a, a gunshot wound. So uh, I, I uh, went with them and I got to the edge of the road and it was like really steep V-shaped gully and they just pushed me. 
The only thing I could do was literally run as fast as I could, you know, to keep my balance. And we did that for like 10, 15 minutes. And we just kept running and slipping and sliding, you know, and it's raining and it's muddy. And we, we finally get someplace and they're on the, they're on their radios checking in. And I asked them, who, who are you guys? And they're screaming with this campesino accent. Hey, you know, and I said, well, what's that? I didn't know. I mean, he was even madder now that I never heard of him. So uh, they said National Liberation Army, you know, and uh, I remember the last newscast I heard about them was Colin Powell just declared them a terrorist army. Yeah, you're thinking this is not good timing. <laughs> no, I'm not. You know, and, and, and I tell you, um, travelers, especially motorcycle travelers, we all have our own little tricks of the trade and things that we do with dummy wallets and sometimes false identification. So to get by different groups at different times, I had the I had bogus uh, press credentials, one that said CNN for um, for leftist groups and one for if they were a right uh, a right group, then I had one uh, to show Motorcycle Magazine. Because you're going to get a different response for each one. The guys, the right. right-wingers hate CNN. So uh, I, they told me who they were. And, you know, uh, this may sound funny because it did to a lot of people, but I said, hey, you know, okay, bueno. He has started buscando los studies. I've been looking all over for you guys. I came here to um, to interview you and write a story. <laughs> <laughs> Did they buy it? Uh, no, no. <laughs> but you know, um, it's hard to say what they bought because they later on gave me a pencil and paper, and they they weren't really sure one way or the other. But you know, the truth was I was posting online journals a couple times a week and I was interviewing people. So I was, in fact, out to meet the people of South America and write their stories as to whether I was looking for rebels. Probably not. <laughs> but I had to think of something that that had an, a sufficient um, ring of truth to it. And that's what it was. And I had just had a biopsy done for prostate cancer from an enlarged prostate and was negative, but a friend of mine had just died of prostate cancer. So uh, that's when I told them that I had prostate cancer and that uh, once they had me in the mountains, that was my story. I was trying to get back to my bike to get some medicine. And they said, tell us the name of the medicine and we'll have our doctors I'll bring that out to you. So um, they, they weren't buying that, that story. So they cared that you were you remained alive. Why why you? Why did they let that bus go and just take you? Any idea? Well, when they go onto a bus, from what uh, I I was told by other hostages, they um they they look down the aisles to see how you're dressed, and they look at your watch and your shoes, and if you look like you got money, they don't call it kidnapping and they don't call it ransom. They call it it's a war tax. And it's, it's a flat 15,000 pesos at that time, which was $7,500. And that's what all the locals get, unless you're like a corporate executive. But if you look like somebody that owns a car, that means you or your family can muster up to 7,500 bucks. And that's a standard fee. And so, but once they talked to me, and I found out later because I was on a green KLR uh, 650, they thought I was military. They had no idea I was an American until I talked. And at that point, they said, get rid of everybody else. We'll take this guy. Uh, and that's pretty much what I surmised. Uh, they, don't, they don't tell you anything. And you have to be very careful about asking any questions. You know, a, a reporter was interviewing me afterwards. And he said to me, what did they want from you? And I said, I don't know. And he looked at me dumbfounded. He said, you didn't ask? And I said, no. I said, if I asked, then that would blow my story that I was there looking for them. And in retrospect, I played this back in my head. I, I would do the exact same thing all over again. I mean, what would, what would you or anybody else say? You're grabbed by Al-Qaeda or ISIS or any other terrorist group. What do you say? You know, what do you do? And they, if you panic and go, you know, then you go down that, that, that path and you don't, you don't get out of that. You have to say, oh, that's great. Yeah, I'm, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And for what I do in the martial arts and judo, it's redirecting, it's using the person's energy. And, and that's what you do. That's what you do. You don't collide. And so I, I basically used pure martial arts throughout my, uh, my captivity and, and uh, subsequent, um, you know, getting no shake in all this. 
you know, emotional and, and, and psychological trauma. Right. Yeah, I think you have to fall back to your instincts and trust them. You know, the, the more you ask and the more involved you get and the more uh, – the deeper your story goes, the more risk there is to uh, to screwing up your story with yeah. them. Or, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, because I, I was questioned forwards and backwards. I was interrogated almost every night. So what were they asking you when they were doing the interrogations? Yeah, the stupidest stuff that you could imagine. They Remember, these are mountain campesinos. Half of them had never seen a city, and the other half had never, never seen asphalt. Campesinos means la, la gente del campo, the people of the uh, country folks, country boys is all. It's not a derogatory term. Okay. And they live way up there, and they're poverty-stricken, and they're, they're um, exploited by their government. They can't grow crops. According to them, our, at the time we were spraying for cocoa, it had killed everything that they had, and they were starving, and they were blaming us. And they were blaming the Colombian government, and we were in con collusion with them. And uh, now they got a they got a gringo, and so it was a Marxist group. So there was a, a political officer, and they interrogated me every night, made a little circle around me, and, and made me listen to this radio broadcast with this Cuban commentator every morning and every night. It was the anti-American hour, and it was on and on and on about what we're doing in the developing world and all the crimes that America's done. You know, going back to the we stole the Panama Canal from them. Uh, well, we did. <laughs> Panama was Colombia, or at least that part of it. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, they're mad. And and um, and I was the guy. And, you know, so they would beat the crap out of me and spit on me. And, you know, I'd say, you know, I didn't vote for him either. And then one night after a couple of weeks, this, <clears throat> this one commandante, um, I, I looked at him. I said, do you control your government? No. I said, do you like your government? No. Do you appreciate what your government does? No. Do you approve of what your government does? No. Do you believe your government is correct, uh, corrupt? Yes. And I said, what in the makes you think I'm any different? And there was like this big pause and everybody looked at each other. And I said, all the governments are corrupt. Everybody in the world. I said, I don't control my government. I don't tell them what to do. I don't have a say in it. You know, it's it's the multinational corporations. It's the super rich. That's who's running the world. And that's who's running Colombia. And that's who's running the United States and the, and the Russians. And you, you, you name it. That's that's what it is. You know, we're all in the same boat together. And it was at that point, some of them were scratching their head going, wait a minute, you know. And I said, soy como, como ustedes, you know, I'm I'm like you. Yeah, so you made yourself out. I mean, you you show them that you're just a regular guy that you you have no pull, oh, and, and uh, they just like they do. They have the ability to um, uh, to find out things about you because the first thing they asked me for, they didn't, they never asked me for a passport. They asked me what my social security number was. Really? Yeah, and that scared me because I thought they'd do a proper a property profile on me. And at the time, I owned a, a ranch in the mountains. And they just think we're all uh, billionaires in the U.S. They think we're flying around on jets like Donald Trump and that we all have money and that we're, you know, that we support the government and all these kinds of things. It never dawns on them that we're working stiffs like they are. And they would point to the, the stupid questions that they would ask me over and over again. They'd point to my watch. What does that cost? What's the percentage of Americans that have that? How much do your shoes cost? How much do your pants cost? How much did that motorcycle cost? How much did this and that? And how much do you earn? And you, if you say a number like $1,000 to them, that's like saying a million dollars to people that, that live in the mountains that really don't make any cash. They eke out barely enough food to keep from starving to death. So if you tell them you earn a thousand dollars a month, you can't say, "Yeah, but I got an electric bill that's a hundred, and I got you know rent, I got this and that." They, it just goes beyond their comprehension. Right. Yeah, and they, they're 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 like if you could just picture some some backwoods kids in the mountains of Arkansas that that don't have any connection to the outside world, and and how do you explain to them? Um, the only thing they that they knew was the kids. I call them the kids. They were in their teens. They all liked me because they'd heard of Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee. And I had all these business cards in my pocket from my uh, martial arts school. So they knew I was a teacher. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, they kept asking, you know, Bruce Lee, you know, Chuck Norris and that kind of stuff, you know. So I got along pretty good with the with the youngsters, the older guys. They were battle hardened and they were they were the killers and, and um, they, they didn't like me. 
So was there anybody else in there with you at the time? Yeah. Yeah, there was. And, um, but they would rotate in and out. Uh, when they grabbed me, I guess they took somebody else either from a car or a bus, either right before me or after, because we rendezvoused with another group after a couple hours. And you had to be real careful because when they were trying to talk to me, he was asking me some questions, uh, one of the other hostages, and I didn't know if he was a Garia plant or, you know, if if later on he would try to get favor with the, with our captors and say, well, the gringo told me this or that. So you couldn't, you couldn't trust anybody. So those guys, you know, they, one by one, they got released. So I was the last one, but occasionally uh, guys would, um, we would, we would meet up on the trail and, and, and go to another camp where they had other hostages and they were, they were fresh. And when I'd been there a couple of weeks, I was beat up pretty bad. And the, the bugs are, you, you, you wouldn't believe the insects in those mountains. You put your hand on the ground for 10 seconds and you got bugs, hundreds of them crawling up your arm. Just it, it's, it's incredible. So I got all these big purple welts all over me from the bug bites and, and, and beat up. And I, I didn't have a mirror. I couldn't see what I looked like, but I, well, I'd see by the expression on the, on the fresh guys faces, the people that were just kidnapped. Yeah. And they're still in there. They're like in a suit and a tie with their loafers and stuff. And I was lucky enough. I had motorcycle boots. So, you know, you're going up and down really, really steep mountains and they're muddy and they're, you know, rocky trails and it's, it's raining and whatnot. And these guys are in their, their suits and their ties and their loafers. Yeah. They're probably thinking, man, if they did that to you, here I am dressed in my, my shirt and tie. What are they going to do to me? Oh yeah. These guys are looking for money. Athletic Brewing is pioneering non-alcoholic craft beer. Yeah, I said non-alcoholic craft beer. And there's a number of reasons you might want to do that. Whether you're training for an event, which a lot of our listeners are, or, you know, if, you, if you're babysitting and don't want to be drunk in case something happens. I mean, stuff happens, but you still want to sit down and enjoy the game and have a beer. This is an incredible option for a full-flavored, full-bodied beer. Each can is only 50 to 70 calories. With IPA, golden ale, stouts, and tons of seasonal offerings, Athletic Brewing is a great option if you want that craft brewery taste. Uh, but not deal with the effects of alcohol itself. Uh, if you'd like to save 15% on your first order, go to athleticbrewing.com and use the code ADVENTURE at checkout. Did you ever feel like they were going to, to kill you at this point? Were you kind of convinced through what you had been through that they were eventually going to let you go? Uh, you just didn't know how long. Well, I tested the waters a couple times and asked them some simple questions. And the answer was, Kian Sabe means um, who knows, you know. And in, in that context, it was kind of like a smart ass answer. And I realized nobody's going to tell me anything. So you don't want to give somebody the satisfaction of, you know, saying, well, what's going to happen? What are you going to do? So you just got to play it off like, well, when am I going to meet the main guy to do my interview? And no matter what they were doing to me, I stuck with that. I never did the, are you going to let me go? And, <laughs> well, I mean, in, in retrospect, you, you, all I can say is you got You had to have been there. Yeah. Right. If that's your story that you came there. You can't start whining about, oh, let me go and this and that. I just said, hey. I'm here. I'm here till I get to talk to the commandante, you know, but I'm real sick with this prostate cancer. I do have to get back and get this medicine or I'm going to die. So did, were they buying the, the prostate cancer problem? I mean, you talked about them, you know, give it, give me the name of the medicine and we'll go back up to the motorcycle. What came of that? It's, it's, it's hard to say what they bought and what they didn't buy, but they weren't convinced strongly enough of anything. I did hear them arguing because the older guys, they wanted, they just wanted to kill me. And they, they want, uh, my guess is they wanted to do it real slow. And then I realized that they were taking orders and they were, they were pretty disciplined actually. And, uh, and some of the best woodsmen you'll ever meet. I mean, they could take a machete and just chomp on that bamboo and, and, and build a little small village in, in a matter of an hour where there was right. beds and platforms and chairs and all kinds of stuff. It was, it was amazing what they could do and how fast they could set up a camp and then tear it down all down in two minutes and, and be wrapped and ready to go. 
uh, if, if they thought, you know, if the, if the orders came over the radio, you know, pack it up, get out of there. This was five weeks in this. How did you finally get out of this situation? Well, it's it's kind of a long story, but um, it, it it was coming to a it was it was coming to a head. They had done a mock execution on me. They had done a lot of mind games. They were shining a light in my eyes every fifteen minutes at night, and I'm chained to a tree. And so the sleep deprivation was really getting to me. And it was is a constant stress level like you you couldn't believe. Uh, I, I don't know how to describe it other than when people said, "Well, what did it feel like?" Well, stick your finger in a light socket for five weeks, pull it out, and then imagine if somebody says, how do you feel? Describe what you feel. It was a, a stress level so incredibly intense. I couldn't, you know, the, the, the psychological constant, constant, you know, what, what's happening? What's good, what are they going to do? What's this or that? And there's no one to talk to. There's no communication with the outside world. I didn't know if we were in World War III because all I know is a couple of days before they grabbed me, I heard that the United States government was getting ready to go into Afghanistan looking for some guy named Osama bin Laden. And that was some kind of invasion. So I didn't, I didn't know, you know, uh, there was, there was no contact with the outside world. So this whole, whole thing was the biggest mind f you could imagine. And there's just, just, there's just nothing that you can do. You just have to bide your time and try to hold it together. And so they saw, they were, they were beating me up. But then I realized, you know what? If they wanted to hurt me, they could hit me with a stick. They weren't hurting me. There was nothing broken on me. So I said, well, no broken bones means they want me to be able to march. If they want me to march, they want me alive. And that's all I could think of is that hopefully cooler heads prevail and figure I have some kind of value to them. And uh, we work it that way. And then they did a couple of these fake releases on me, and uh, I started to go off the deep end. And I actually, what what centered me was catching them laughing at me. And I don't know how to relate that, but it changed everything. It changed the whole dynamic. It's kind of like if you were being robbed and you got your you got your woman with you, and some guy pulls out a gun and says, "Give me all your money," and you're okay, okay, just let us go. You think about protect your gal, and you give him all the money. Then he reaches over and he starts rubbing her ass and goes, hey, that's pretty nice. I might want some of that. That changes the dynamic, correct? Yeah, there's no doubt about that. That's a different mindset. Okay, so that, that was like, you know, you cross the line, we're going for broke now. So that, that was what changed it to me when they, when they laughed at me. And then I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this thing to a head. So I, um, I remembered when I trained in my Chinese systems, we did lengthy fast, a uh, couple, uh, usually three days, but some I'd done at 10 days. And so uh, I knew what the what I could do. And I was already, you know, basically dying of malnutrition. And so I I just went on, I said, I, I can't eat, I won't eat anymore. So I went on a hunger strike. And, you know, they were like, when, uh, some of them were believing it and some of them weren't. They were like, oh, he'll eat, he'll eat. And then all of a sudden, you know, they start handing me eggs and fish and that kind of stuff. And I said, no, <laughs> no, I don't know if you can imagine the discipline it takes to turn that down. I'm sure. And, uh, but the interesting thing is on a fast, it's just the first three days and then, you know, it doesn't matter. And strangely enough, the reason we do it in meditation is because the thinking becomes so clear that your senses awake. And so it's really an interesting experience and it eliminates all the negatives from your thinking. It becomes very clear. So I basically did that, and that wasn't happening fast enough. So I said, um, "I got to convince them that I'm I'm dying." So I uh, I needed blood, and rather than there was no way to cut my body to get the blood out, so the best way to do it was through my nose. So I still had my motorcycle keys, and I uh, shoved the key up into my nose. Oh man! Oh yeah. <laughs> yes, I did that. Oh. And um, I wiggled it around a little bit, you know, and sneezed and got a little trickle, but I needed a lot. So I, uh, I put my key up there and smacked myself. And then I, you know, I got a good flow going and, and directed it around my crotch. So when the sun came up, they, they looked at me and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, sangre, sangre, which means blood, blood. And they're on, they're on their radios and there's like mass panic. They go, What's that? And I said, I told you I got prostate cancer. I'm bleeding inside. I'm dying, you know. So in other words, this was my last ditch effort to to convince them, you know, 
my gamble is that they'll do something to get rid of me, some kind of deal, whatever, to get rid of me while I'm still alive. If I'm dead, there's no value. Right. Just by the fact that I know there was guys in that camp that wanted me dead, and the fact that they didn't do it was they were taking orders from a political wing somewhere. So I didn't know, was my government aware? Were they, you know, were they broadcasting bad things about me or bad things about the government using me? Or I had no idea because they, they had beaten me and made me sign documents and that kind of stuff. And I, I don't know what the hell I signed. And anyway, as, as, as it turned out, they sent the, one of the big honchos out from the city and he'd clearly never been in the country before. And he walked in, they had me on this cement floor in this, in this deserted ranchita. And uh, the shock on his face, he turned and looked away, you know, because there was blood. It looked like they'd been slaughtering hogs in this room. This is after I've been doing it a couple of days, you know, and he, he turned away and I said, now you look at me. Don't you turn away. This is this is how you solve the problems of Colombia. You do this to me. I said, the, iron, the irony is I was on their side. I had written articles on behalf of the Campesino movement throughout Latin America. And I, and I was a supporter of these guys. And this guy couldn't couldn't look at me, you know, and I kept screaming at him, you look at me, don't you don't you look away. I, you know, I was a mess. I made sure that blood was smeared all over everything. And uh, he, he was clearly freaked out. And so he left and this one nurse, she, she said she was a doctor, but she was pretty cool. She came in and she's crying and stuff. And she goes, you're, you're getting out. He's, he's ordered your release. And I said, no, they've said that before. I don't believe him. And she says, no, when Roberto gives the order, you're, you're being released. So by that time, I, I lost my strength. I couldn't, um, I couldn't stand up or walk or anything. And they, this one commandante who was kind of leader of the pack for doing all the to me, and he came in and he screamed at me, get up. And I said, I, I can't. I won't. So they had to pick me up, and, um, and they threw me over the side of a mule and started walking me on. I didn't frankly know if they're taking me out to shoot me or to ex to, um, to free me. I, I didn't really know. I imagine at that point, you almost don't care. I mean, that's a lot to go through that. How do you keep your emotional resolve through all that? Oh, I'm telling you, it's a second by second struggle, struggle. The hardest, the hardest, if you combined every negative experience in your entire life and compacted it into one second, that's how one second is in their captivity. It's horrible. It's absolutely right. horrible. Um, so anyway, so we're going along this trail and um, we come to a fork in the road and one went down and one went up. And the saying was in the mountains, Masariba means higher into the mountains. So if you're going higher, it means they're going to keep you longer. If you're going Masabajo, it means you're going lower and there's a chance to be freed. It means they're taking you back to the highway. So this, this fork in the trail it went up and then it went down and I looked down and there was a river and there was a dirt road. And that was the closest thing I'd seen to civilization in five weeks. And then, uh, <laughs> for some reason he went, he went higher in Masariba. He, he took the high road and my spirits just sunk. And I go, all this stuff didn't work. Oh man. Didn't work. And then next thing I know, a couple hours later, we, we, we started descending and I looked down into a clearing and there was a white SUV with a big uh, red cross on the roof and red cross emblems on the door. <laughs> and uh, I said to the guys that were leading the mule and the, and, the, and the soldiers, I said, I was cursing them. I said, take me back. I don't believe it. Take me back in the mountains. And I tried to turn the mule around. I said, I'm not going. Take me back. Because I, I couldn't. I don't, know how you, I don't know how to explain it, but I couldn't let myself believe it. Yeah, after all, that couldn't be real. Well, because they, they had done the false release thing before, and I felt myself going over the edge, and I realized if, if they let me do that again, and I was told that was a tactic they were doing because they were going to give my body back in one piece with a broken mind. That was what the girl told me. So I get down about them, and I fell off the mule, and this they helped me back up, and this lady walks up this italian lady wearing these little wireframe glasses <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't believe her you know I, I i couldn't i couldn't let myself so uh she says hello mr hegstead my name is annalisa de paolo i'm a delegate from the international committee of the red cross 
and I'm here to take you to a representative of your government. And uh, what I didn't put in my book was I just cursed her. I, and I said, I know you're one of them. And I'm not biting on this. Just take me back in there. Skip this charade. And she said, no, I, I know exactly what you're going through. And I know that you can't comprehend what's happening. But she says, I have documents here that I have to get the commandante to sign for the prisoner exchange. Um, suddenly, they're going to go by international protocol. Yeah, right. And uh, she said, it's going to be about 15, 20 minutes, and we're going to put you in that wagon and get some water into you, and then we're taking you to Medellin. And so I'm sitting, and I'm like a babbling idiot, you know, I'm just, I I can't talk, I can't think straight, and I'm trying to drink water, and and, um, because I'd eventually stopped taking water too, fluids, and uh, so I I couldn't hold anything down, and um, next thing I know, we're in the wagon, and we're driving and I'm yelling at her. I said, you don't know, we will never get out of here. This, this whole mountains are full of rebels. And it was all rebel held toward I know I saw the, I saw them, you know? And uh, she said, no. And she held up her red cross ID and she said, no, we have clearance uh, from all the groups. Even the FARC knows we're bringing a prisoner out. So we have clearance. We're, we're a neutral organization and, and we have permission from all the rebel groups and the, um, the uh, paramilitary, the military groups too, to, to get you out safely. And I didn't believe it till we pulled up to the Red Cross Center in, um, in Medellin. And that was a prison in itself. It looked, I mean, a big steel bars on the door, just like in a prison, thick steel bars. And uh, they, they brought me in there, you know, and then I'm like, well, maybe I am free. And the first call in the Red Cross Center is, is my best friend. And at the time, my senior black belt in the judo school, and his first words... He doesn't say, are you sick? Are you tired? You know, you want to come home? Would you break your leg? He goes, don't worry, brother. Another bike's on the way. <laughs> That's <Where's> incredible. <laughs> so were you thinking, no way in hell I'm not taking a bike. I'm coming home. Or were you thinking, yeah, get that thing over here? I never, it never crossed my mind for a split second to turn around. All I ever thought of was I didn't know if I was getting out. I had to make the assumption that it would be years. And I just thought, well, if it's a different time of year, then I'll go down the the East Coast through Brazil and then come back up the West Coast, you know, depending on the weather. I just, I just, uh, it it just never for a second entered my mind um, (laughs) to turn around. I don't know if that it's difficult to believe or whatever, but that was the only thing that kept me focused, you know. Yeah, it's difficult to imagine, but was do you think that was your part of your resolve to get through this whole ordeal? Is that you said I'm going to get past this and I'm going to put it behind me by continuing on the journey that I I left for? Well, in martial arts, we we learn, you know, on, on higher levels that you do everything you say you're going to do. It's all about goal orientation. I'm going to do this, and the only thing that will stop me is a bullet, and it has to be between my eyes. If you wing me, I'll just keep coming. And that's the that's the mentality if you're going to compete on a national and international level, and not just martial art and anything. Your your determination, uh, it's it's on a different level. So it never enters your mind to stop or to quit. You know, you have to tell people that are really hardcore athletes, you have to strap them down if they're injured, because we'll continue to train, we'll continue to compete with an injury. We just won't stop. You know, it's just that's just the way it is. You know. And I said, that's where I'm going to South America, to the tip of South America and back. And that's where I'm going. And um, that's it. And, and I mean, you could call me a fool or whatever, but uh, this probably the the safest thing would have been to go home and go to therapy and all that, which, you know, I, I to me, it was all about I turn around, they win. And I, and I got an argument that the FBI hostage release team, you know, come up on an embassy plane, pick me up. There are actually four Cuban FBI agents. They're, they're Cubans, born, born, you know, uh, originally, but they were FBI agents, American citizens now. But so, um, you know, they, um, they're, they said, we have a plane. They're going to debrief me and all this stuff. And they said, we have a plane. We're going to take you back to the United States, put you in the hospital. And I said, no, I'm not going to the hospital. And they said, well, yeah, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. They said, yeah, you are. And I said, no, I'm not. I have another motorcycle coming and I'm going to continue riding. They said, well, no, you're getting on a plane. That's it. And I, and I stood up and I said, you know, 
<laughs> I can barely walk. I have this walking stick and this scraggly beard. And <laughs> I look at him. I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm damn tired of people with guns telling me what to do. I'm walking out of here right now. If you don't like it, you can shoot me in the back. And the doors are these electrically operated doors and they fling open. And I don't realize it, but we're on the tarmac of the Bogota airport. <laughs> so I'm wa- stumbling down the tarmac of the airport with these four suits chasing me down there and that's are <laughs> taxing around us. And fucking... <laughs> They're going, okay, okay, Mr. Hank said, you know, what? you know, let's go back inside and talk about it. I said, there's nothing to talk about. I said, I turn around, they win. You don't get it. I said, what, what the hell's the matter with you guys? Why aren't you helping me? I'm an American. You're an American. Why aren't you helping me? And they looked at me with this <laughs> bewildered look and they said, you're serious. You really want to continue. We thought you were just crazy and didn't know what you wanted. I said, I am definitely crazy, but I know what I want and I got to continue. If I don't continue, they win. And they said, okay, bravo. Let's go back in and talk. And they, they pulled their money together and made a loan for me till I could get money transferred down and, and uh, got me to a, got me to a hotel. And you can't rent a hotel anywhere in Colombia without a passport. It's a felony just to keep track of people and stuff. And I didn't obviously have a passport and they couldn't even do it. So I found a, the last hotel I'd been at and they had my copy. They had copied my passport. So I did that and wow. down and they got me a brand new passport in a matter of hours and whatnot. And they said, we're going to let you stay here long enough to get a new bike, but you have to stay inside your hotel room. You can't go out. That's amazing. This is a movie script you're describing. Here. Uh, well, Nat Geo made a documentary out of it. No kidding. I'll have to look that up. I, uh, you know, and the other part of the story is, is one of my best friends came down looking for me and he, he got deported. So, so he decided uh, to come down there and figure out what had happened to you. Oh, not only that, he found my motorcycle. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't that hard. There's only one road going to Medellin. Right. I'd been posting journals and said, well, I'm on my, I'm going to Medellin. And that was the last they heard. So somewhere between Medellin and, and Bogota, I disappeared. And there wasn't much out there in the country. There was like this one restaurant. And I kept writing in my journals about Pollo Asado and uh, they're driving along in the, in this car and they see Pollo Asado uh, restaurant. And Joe said, well, you know what? That looks familiar. And they went in there and the people said, yeah, we, he was here. He gave us his card to look at his website. And then they, were, they met a bus driver out there. He was the bus driver that saw me being kidnapped. Nobody knew uh, exactly what happened. One of the rebel groups called the embassy and said, we're holding an American. And our, our policy, uh, which is correct, by the way, is we say thank you very much. Not we, but the government. And they hang up the phone. We don't negotiate with terrorists, nor should we, because that will endanger virtually every American in the world. So if you call up the embassy and say, we just, we just kidnapped an American, they go, okay, what's his passport or what's his social security number? Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye. And that's what they do. And so uh, Joe found out it was the ELN from the bus driver and uh, went and they, they found my bike where they had stashed it in this, in this like wooden shack on by the side of the road. And he went back to get a, to get a way to, to pick it up and take it back. And when he came back, they, they had removed it. Somebody stole it. This episode is sponsored by Aftershocks. They are headphones with bone conducting technology. So they rest in front of your ears, not inside your ears like most headphones. And the benefit is they keep your ears free. I would have felt so much safer on my bike trips if I would have had these. But, you know, I'm on the bike for 12 hours. I'm not going to not listen to something. So I did put myself at risk a lot. And I would highly recommend something that allows you to keep your ears free and be able to listen to this show or music if you choose that. But come on, you want to listen to this show. They have a six-hour battery life awesome audio quality and you can get $50 off the Trex Air Adventure Bundle or the Trex Titanium Adventure Bundle at asp.aftershocks.com and that is also in the show notes. I continued the trip, went down to South America, made it down to uh, Tierra del Fuego, came back. My brother flew down and, and, and air freighted his bike into Panama and rode back with me. And, and then uh, six, seven months later, I decided, you know what? As a collective middle finger to, to terrorists around the world, I'm going to keep riding around the world. And so BMW gave me a, a new 650 Dakar. 
And uh, I took off, air freighted into um, Tokyo, rode around Japan and caught the ferry over to Vladivostok, right on the North Korean border there in Siberia, and rode down, uh, rode around the world, 57 developing countries, spent a couple years out there at my little one-man tent. I, I met the coolest people on planet Earth. Um, the deal for the bike was BMW said you uh, you owe our our dealers in Southern California four slideshows when you come back. Nobody knew what I was going to do. They thought I'd ride around Europe, maybe go to the Kremlin. I brought them pictures of camping out with the Mongolian nomads living with cannibals in Borneo and naked natives, spirit toter natives in Africa, and women with plates in their lips and just the most incredible uh, photographs. And gave a really great show. They flipped out over it. The dealers, everybody wrote to BMW North America. They hired me to do 26 shows nationwide. I ended up doing a career in motivational speaking for this. In fact, um, I will be speaking at Long Beach, the Progressive International Motorcycle Show, on the weekend of November 20th. And then in um, October 30th, weekend of October 30th, in the Motorcycle Show in Portland, Oregon. It's the biggest bike show in North America. And I'll do probably four shows in each one of those events. Oh, very cool. So BMW got a heck of a lot more than they even bargained for. Yep. That's, absolutely. Uh... Absolutely. So tell me about the books. I mean, you went through this whole ordeal and you continued on to, uh, to Tier de Fuego. And then you did the, the BMW sponsored trip uh, across Siberia, Mongolia, that whole area from Japan down to South Africa. How did you take this experience with you on the road when you did this other trip. I imagine this tarnished your view of the world a little bit, at least it had to, but I imagine, you know, obviously you see the good in people and the, the, there's a lot more good in the world than, than there is bad. So how did that, how did your trip, your next trip, uh, how was it affected or how, what did it do for you? Every disaster is also a springboard to the next level, depending on what your attitude is. And when I came out of that jungle, I had two options. One was to go down that path of anger and hatred, resentment and revenge. Um, I thought the only way I can survive this is, believe it or not, forgive, turn the page. And I never allowed myself one split second of negative emotion for that entire experience. Because if I went down that, there's no way back out of it. Right. Good point. And um, that was a pretty hard lesson to learn. But when you carry negative energy, you punish yourself <laughs> to, to have me flipping out in anger and gritting my teeth and having nightmares and, and, and dreaming of vengeance of what I'd do if I caught these guys that tortured me and this and that and go off all that. <laughs> I just wasn't going to let it happen. I wasn't going to let it happen. They, they would just continue to punish me if that happened. And, you know, and I have a feeling that those Higher ups, that was their goal. They know what the what the outcome of that is. The the captors, mind mind you, they don't they don't know what they're doing. They're just following orders. But um, I just wasn't going to let that happen, you know. And really, living well is the best revenge. So I grabbed a motorcycle, and it's just like if you hitchhike somewhere, you meet the best people in the world because that's who has a heart who picks you up, and takes you home, and feeds you, or gives you a couple bucks. And it's the same thing in travel. Whoever invites you home is the people that come up and talk to you when you're traveling. So when you're traveling around the world, you're going to meet the nicest people on the planet. It's this, it's this, I don't know how to explain it. When we ride motorcycles, we don't, we don't see the landscape. Any motorcycle rider that's been around a while will tell you when we ride a motorcycle, we don't see the landscape. We merge with the landscape. We become the landscape. Because we're on there, we're in that state of hyper awareness when we're riding and you're going through the farm country and you can smell the fresh cut fields and it's like the green can, you can feel it stick to your skin. Well, so that's merging with the landscape. And as you weave your way around the world, inch by inch, not on a plane, but you're daily on a motorcycle and you see the footprints of history stamped on the faces of the people. And you see you're in, you begin in Siberia and it's the white or oh, white skinned, blonde, fiery redheads with bright blue eyes. And as you go travel uh, a deeper, a deeper in, into Siberia and Russia, and all of a sudden the skin goes all of, uh, and the eyes go almond and they, they slant up and they slant down. And all of a sudden you're in Mongolia and you're looking into the eyes of the descendants of Genghis Khan. 
and you realize, you know, that you're in this weaving your way through this tapestry of, of fascinating cultures that you're really merging with the landscape of humanity. And that's what the journey is on a motorcycle around the world. You're not on a bus. You're not on a plane. You're not on a tour group. You're out there hopefully by yourself because that's the best way to connect with people. And every day you're meeting somebody that's fascinating and absolutely thrilled to meet you and absolutely anxious to do anything they can do to help you on your journey. So any, any overland traveler will tell you the same thing as I will tell you now. If you want to restore your faith in humanity, take a trip to the developing world overland alone. And you will be so amazed at what people do for you, the outreach, and how the people with the least are there to share the most. So as I went across into Mongolia, it was, it was the Mongolian nomads, you know, it's in their Buddhist karma to care for a stranger. I'd be camped out in the middle of the Gobi Desert, uh, you know, off-road, just using satellite navigation. So, And I can look, and there's nothing for hundreds of miles in either direction, just sprawling out to the horizon. And every morning when I woke up, there was a little bit of, of dried uh, a yogurt and goat's milk outside my tent. It was, it was the nomads. They knew I was there and they took care of me. And, and sometimes I never saw them, you know, and they were always, if I did, flagging me over to give me water or bread or something. And yeah. it was like that all through from the Russians, you know, and, and, and the Siberians, I'd, I'd be in a little Siberian town and they're just poverty stricken in these, these crumbling shacks and whatnot. And they would pick me up and carry me inside to their, to their homes and feed me their last crumbs of bread. And in the morning you'd, I, I, I'd try to hand them some rubles and they'd get furious and they'd slap their heart and no hospitality comes from the heart that can't be bought. You know, and you, you can't help but consider the irony at that very moment. Our respective governments have targeted thermonuclear weapons on one another. And yet here's the Russians when I meet them face to face. They can't do enough for me. They love travelers. And they, as soon as they found out I was American, they, they, they took care of me all the more. So, I mean, you, said, you just can't overlook the irony of that. You know, and that's when it dawned on me that governments may not get along, but people do. You know, left to our own devices, I think the world would be a lot better place if, if the government stepped aside. If we did things to increase travel, we get out to know each other and speak each other's language. And you suddenly realize that, you know what, maybe it's not a good idea to kill these people. <laughs> yeah, I'll drink a beer to that. You're absolutely <laughs> right. We're just all people trying to uh, to live a good life in this world. And, and that's what you, uh, you manage to witness you know, traveling around the world, as you described. Travel anywhere. <laughs> I mean, it's all relative to your last experience. It's adventure travel if you've never crossed a state line, if it's your first motorcycle trip going camping. You got it. It's uh, in our best kept travel secret in America, and everybody's afraid to go, is Mexico. You go to Mexico, and I promise you're going to have the time of your life. Get down below that border and, and, and the last of the American influence, and you get into Mexico, and, and you will be greeted with open arms. I promise you. I guarantee you. And you will have the best time. I never heard anybody come back saying, I wish I didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't either. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's all the same thing. It's adventure travel. And I, I obviously advocate motorcycle adventure travel, but it's certainly not limited to that because I've backpacked around the world. I've done everything from chicken bus to on foot to the Himalayas twice and, you know, hiking and, and, and going on river boats. I'll, I'll do any way I can do it. But motorcycling is really the best way to go because you got your own transportation. But the, the, the hospitality throughout the developing world is overwhelming, indescribable. And it's everywhere, every day, whenever you stop to talk to somebody because they see you, you know, and you got this, this, this motorcycle this, <laughs> that they've never seen before. And this, this, you know, the riding clothes that we wear, this space age plastic suit, you know, and they're like, well, who are you? What are you doing? You know, and I, I got down with 10 different languages when I traveled because it was so important to me to communicate with people. The first thing I do when I cross the border is I just go to the first dirt floor restaurant by the side of the road and park my bike and get off the bike and go sit at a table full of people and smile at them and shake their hand. And I pull out a pencil and paper and I point to a salt shaker. And if it was Spanish, I'd say, como se dice? 
you know, what do you call this? And they would say salt. And I'd write down salt equals salt. <laughs> and so I would just do that for everything on the table. So what I'm doing is I'm getting my dictionary rele relevant terminology for the next two hours. I have been conversing in either Arabic, Russian, um, Basa Indonesia, whatever country I was in, I was down and, I, you know, you get your five W's and you can carry on a conversation with somebody, very rudimentary, very basic conversation, but you can, you know, find out where something is and, and, um, and direct them how to cook your food and how to say no onions. And, and, and everybody, everybody wants to be part of your journey. If, if, if it's just handing you some fruit or if you're cleaning your bike, they're over there doing it with you. Or if you're tightening your chain, they're handing you tools. There is just everybody that sees you wants to be part of the journey. They want to know you. They want to talk to you. You know, and I would burn DVDs of pictures of my trip and I would hand them out to people. And that was like handing out thousand dollar bills. They just. Yeah. And, you know, just uh, overwhelming gratitude. Even in Mexico, when I hand out uh, slideshow presentations of my of my Earth ride with this, it's 325 pictures with uh, translated into Spanish subtitles and whatnot. I'll, and I'll give those out to people and people send me email. Oh, we, you know, we showed that to our neighbors. Everybody came over every night of the week to see it. And we sent it a DVD to the school. They played it in all the classrooms at the school. And yeah, I mean, it's not a big deal here, but it, in other countries, it, it certainly is. So gift giving is 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 um, really important in the developing world, M much more than in giving money. Right. So let's go uh, into your books a little bit, because I want to use that translation of gift giving and people learning more about your journey. Where can they find the two books? Describe. Uh, tell me what the books are and where people can find okay, them. You can find them on Amazon.com. My name is Glenn, G-L-E-N, Hegstad, H-E-G-G-S-T-A-D. I have a website, easy to remember, strikingviking.net, not .com, .net. The Boxing Norwegian, strikingviking.net. It's got all kinds of information. We donate 100% of the royalties from both of my books to international aid organizations, building schools in the developing world primarily Room to Read, where we are busy building schools in Cambodia and Nepal. I don't accept one single penny that all never have, never will for any of my books or international projects for that matter. So you buy a book, you really do a lot. Uh, there's a lot of good energy behind the projects. Well, excellent. Good for you. I think, and I really wanted to make sure that uh, we got that out there. That uh, that these the proceeds for these books go to charity. You're not you're not getting stuff from these. You're you're giving back to uh, to a world that that has given so much to you, even if a piece of it has you know beat you down a little bit. I think your story is not about the tragedy that we just went through. It's an amazing story, but I think your story is about healing. You know, your body, your skin, your arms, they all heal fairly quickly. It's an about healing the mind. And I think every move you made after that experience in Bogota uh, was about healing you. And it's probably more than you could have ever done by going to therapists and going the regular route. By you getting out there on the motorcycle and finishing that trip and taking your other trips, you managed to heal your mind more than than anything else would have. So it's uh, that's the the true amazing story here. Well, and in, in, in all honesty, I have nothing but gratitude for those guys that grabbed me. One, I, I I sympathize with them before and after for their cause. I was on their side. Uh, they're desperate. They're starving. They acted in state of war. Men do things they wouldn't or, ordinarily do. Um, but also that was the best experience ever because that launched me into going around the world. Had that not happened, I would have rode to South America. I said, yeah, I sowed my wild oats. I, I did that. And, um, you know, now I'm back home. But because of that, that propelled me into that world ride. And I met the coolest people, had the best experiences. And the title of my second book is called One More Day Everywhere. And the reason we call it that was when you come back from a journey like that, you're asked all the basic questions you know, what was what was your best experience? What did you learn? And this and that, of course, one comes up, they say, do you have any regrets? And I said, the only regret that I have is that I didn't spend one more day everywhere. And somebody was standing in the crowd. They said, there's a the title to your next book. 
<laughs> That's great. I was wondering about that. <laughs> well, great. I got to tell you, I mean, I was on a tribal level most of the time. And, and um, you know, only a couple of days or a week with, in a village where there's no electricity. I mean, I'm a primitive village. And you're most of the time doing sign language and whatnot, but you're taking their picture for the first time and showing it to them on a, on a um, digital screen and on a computer and all that. I mean, you bond. In a couple of days, you bond. And then when I'm loading up my gear, they're looking at me and I'm looking at them and it hits us. We're never going to see each other again. So we all got a little misty eyed, you know, and I said, you know, I'll never forget you. And they said, no, you'll go to your home country. You'll never think of us again. I said, I have your pictures. So if you ever visit my home, there's about 30 or 40 pictures on the walls in my house. So every time I walk down the hall, I look into the eyes of the people that befriended me and that I stayed with. So, you know, <laughs> I never that's great. Them. I never forget them. I, I, it's true. I'll never see them again. But I wrote about them. They were my subject matter. So if you were going to write a book about somebody, they would certainly want royalties. And there's no way for me to go find these people to give them royalties. So it's a big circle of giving out there. So my logic behind this is I may not be able to repay the people directly who befriended me and cared for me and, and uh, shared their hospitality, but I can certainly um, keep that circle going. And that's the reason for that. Yeah. You're paying it forward. Very good. I, I believe so. You know, and I'm certainly not the only guy out there. There's a lot of guys that do it a lot, a lot uh, more efficiently than I do. Oh, you're, you're doing something great. So don't, uh, don't downsize it. So I want a, one more story out of you before I let you go and I'll let you pick what kind it is. May it be an inspirational story, a funny story, or just an amazing experience that you had on your travels uh, that is in inspirational in itself, something to look up to. Oh. <laughs> You're talking about every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me say, probably the, the, the longest sustained physical challenge that I ever encountered in my life. Uh, first of all, I'll give you a little background. Uh, crossing Siberia at that time was was pretty rugged. There's a thousand miles stretch between uh, Chita and Habarovsk that a lot of guys put their bike on a train. It's pure thousand miles of motocross, hardcore motocross, mud and whatnot. That was pretty tough. Uh, my friend Jimmy Lewis got me through it. I took a Jimmy Lewis riding course a couple of weeks before I left for Siberia. He taught me more in a weekend that I'd learned in 30 years of motorcycle riding. So that helped. And I thought Siberia was the toughest thing I'd ever done. I got to Borneo. I set the world's record as the first guy to actually loop the island. It was 3,000 kilometers. And I realized why no one had done it before. They had more common sense. It was, uh, <laughs> it was just mud, bogged down mud. I mean, you'd ride 10 hours and make 30 miles. And you were just spinning, spinning, spinning. I was out there for weeks trying to get around there. And that was um, that was the longest you know, in, in, in judo, it's kind of like wrestling. You know, you're, um, you got a six-minute round hands-on, and you're so exhausted. After the second or third minute, your lungs are on fire. You just got to keep on and on and on. You got to finish that round. You win that round. You go on to the next, the next, the next, till you win the event. It's a very, very tough um, sport. They say that the judo um, athletes are the most well-conditioned athletes of the Olympics, even more so than wrestlers. Um, so out there in Borneo, it was my background in judo that got me through that. But that was the longest sustained challenge. And I, and I mentioned that about judo because to me, it was an equivalent of that every moment of the day. I was uh, purple in my face and you're right on the equator. And uh, there was no way to get food in there. I didn't, I didn't have room for it. I just had room for water. And I just lived on bananas and um, that root, that ground paste that the natives eat. Uh, you know, it was three weeks. And so that was the, the hardest thing that I, uh, I ever did. Wow, that sounds grueling. Oh, yeah. But I mean, it was, it was very rewarding. And I actually turned my GPS log over to the Indonesian government. So I, and nobody had, had crossed that before. And, I, and it, there really isn't a road going through Kalimantan, the Indonesian part. I could only find these mud trails. And then it ended in a river. And I'd wait for a boat. And I put my bike on a little small fishing boat. It would take me down to where I could find an, another trail connecting. And that was it. There is no actual road, but I had the first GPS, GPS log and I met some engineers that were road engineers from Indone Indonesian government. And I gave them the GPS logs from that. Oh, very cool. Very cool. 
All right, Glenn. Well, I appreciate your time telling me about your your amazing um, story. I mean, it's your your whole life story. But uh, I'm I'm pleased to see that you came out the the person that you did. It could have gone completely opposite of that. So good for you for pulling through that and living your life like uh, there might not be a tomorrow. Well, that's good, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak on here. Uh, remember that um, one person can't change the world, but collectively we all can. We clean up our own little corner of the world, pick our battle, do something for somebody else, preferably somebody you might not like or an organization you might not like. Um, Just get out there and do something because collectively there's still time. We can change the world um, if we all just keep that positive attitude and remember that every disaster is, in fact, a springboard to the next level. Absolutely. Well said. Well, I'll get your uh, your website and books and everything linked up on our show notes just so people can go find you and, uh, and learn more about you and read about your story themselves. I appreciate your time. Very cool. Hasta la vista. First of all, thank you so much for listening to the episode. Uh, secondly, if you would like to get in touch, you can leave us a voicemail at 812-MAIL-POD. You can also send us an email, info at adventuresportspodcast.com. Get a hold of us on Facebook, Instagram. Contact us on the website. Like, There's just a thousand ways to do it. If you know somebody that would make a good guest for the show, whether they're whether it's you or somebody you know with a really cool story or background or does an interesting sport, get in touch. We'd love to have them on. Also, if you'd like to be a patron, a.k.a. a supporter of the show, patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast you can sign up for as little as a buck a month you can sign up for five bucks a month and lastly thank you to our sponsors whose messages follow right now go to athleticbrewing.com and use the code adventure at checkout to save 15 percent off the best tasting and lowest calorie non-alcoholic beer you're ever going to try don't forget to save fifty dollars off a headset bundle at asp.aftershocks.com. It's my new favorite way to listen to music and podcasts and stay safe while I run and ride my bike. After all this adventure talk, if you need to go to a place and buy some gear and talk to an expert, go to backpacktribe.com. They can help you choose the right gear and they have the expertise and know-how with each piece of equipment. Now get out there and do something crazy.